Welcome everyone. My name is Bridget Cabrera, she, her, hers, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action. MFSA is an over 100 year old justice seeking faith based policy and organizing network whose mission is to mobilize, lead and sustain a progressive United Methodist movement, energizing people to be agents of God's justice, peace and reconciliation. And we're so excited to be co hosting this series of webinars with our dear partner United Methodist for Cairo's response. A few announcements concerning our call today. Um, we invite you to please keep your videos off um, while we're on the call. It helps with having so many folks on the call with our connection and our internet connection. Our webinars are a place to learn, engage, and be in community together in order to create an equitable and brave space. Uh, we do not tolerate any hate speech on our webinars. We're also recording this webinar. That recording will be shared in the coming days. You'll get some information about that. We invite you to share that with others. As you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Those will get um, will be used during the Q&A. And the closed captioning is automatically generated. Um, you should see that on the bottom of your screen. And so please excuse any spelling or any other errors that will probably occur. Um, thanks you all for being here. Now I'll turn this over to our moderator for our conversation today, John. Hi, I'm John Wagner. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of United Methodist for Kairos Response. And uh, I'm co-chair along with Lisa Bender, who is also on the call here today. United Methodist for Kairos Response is a movement for Palestinian human rights. And our goal is freedom, justice, and equality for all Palestinians and Israelis. We engage in boycott and divestment campaigns, uh, political uh, actions to change uh, government policy, and education to help our church and our society understand what is really happening in the Holy Land and how we can support the Palestinian people in their liberation struggle. We believe we are called to this work by Jesus Christ who values all people on this earth. Um, and I truly welcome you. We're so grateful for you being with us. And uh, some of you have been on webinars with us before. Others, this is the first time. I'm so excited about our guests here today. They are um, uh, Elizabeth Melendez, Melendez Rivera. And uh, she is uh, uh, the organizing director for Jewish Voice for Peace. And then I'm going to introduce after her, um, Alice Rothschild, Dr. Alice Rothschild, a retired physician, professor at Harvard, and um, an author and lecturer uh, of great note. So we're so pleased to have both these persons with us to talk about both Jewish Voice for Peace and some of the current events uh, that you all are interested in. I'm going to introduce Lisbeth first. Um, Lisbeth has extensive experience organizing across the intersections of diverse justice movements in the United States, including in her last position as Director of Faith Outreach and Training at the Human Rights Campaign. Her work has led to her to crisscross the country, training workers and community leaders in organizing leadership development and community building strategies from a grassroots perspective. Um, her, she can be uh, uh, contacted you can view her work and position at Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, jewishvoiceforpeace.org, and that should be in the chat as well and we'll, it's pretty easily available. So Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you, John. Um, first of all, I wanna greet you from the Pescatar Way uh, land, stolen land in Eastern United, what is known as the United States. Uh, again, uh, it is a pleasure as always to share time and space with Methodists across the country and the world. As John mentioned, I am the former faith director for the Human Rights Campaign. So I have shared time, space, and struggle with many of you uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, currently, I am the organizing director at Jewish Voice for Peace. And what brought me here today was to talk a little bit about our history, about our current campaigns, and to answer some of the questions that many of us have, particularly when uh, 
when as Christians we're asked to support a, a you know a state that it's not acting in accordance to the justice principles under which we act and try to live into every day. So Jewish Voice for Peace um, is it's an organization that was born in 1994 and with like many organizations for social movements was born out of the questions of students, three students in particular, who went out looking for Jewish um, allies that would see the world in which they, they, you know, they saw it, a way in which you would think of not the state of Israel, not the invasion of, or the Nakba of, and the displacement of Palestinian and other people, in what is now known as the State of Israel in 1948 uh, and before that, uh, but that would understand that uh, we could all still continue to live together and recognize one another and be just about the way in which we do this without genocide, without violence, um, and in a just, in a just way. Uh, when Julia, Julie, and Rachel came together at the University of California in Berkeley, uh, they were literally seeking to respond constructively to controversies around the 1996 Western Wall excavation uh, because it infringed in not just sacred Jewish land, but Muslim and Christian land as well. Uh, they, they came together and like many other national organizations, began a movement that then spread through the country and was in rose from its grassroots into a national perspective that values more than anything discourse process and consensus than a top-down approach that would tell people how to act, what to do and how to do it. So part of our core principles at Jewish Voice for P or JVP as I will refer to just for shorthand um, moving forward is that we will indeed um, engage in dialogue, engage in discussion, answer questions and struggle with what does it mean to be, to decouple anti-Semitism from anti-Zionism. Zionism is a, as you, many of you know, a philosophy that uh, extends to the end of, you know, the 19th century. Um, this idea that there was a land for all. And in, in for many ways, uh, you know, we struggle with that, uh, not just in the Judaic faith, but also in the Christian faith, as we have seen many Christian Zionists defending the state of Israel, genocide um, in, in, in the land for the simple desire of understanding that when the day comes for judgment, as it calls in Revelations, that is the place where it will originate. That is the place where we will end. And there are many interpretations to Revelations. And I say that uh, one thing that was not mentioned in my, in my bio is um, that I am, I, you know, I hold a Master's of Divinity and I'm completing my doctorate in ministry. Uh, at United Theological Seminary, who happens to also be a UMC accredited uh, seminary for the training of, of clergy and ministers within the UMC. Uh, so during the first years, we, we grew, we spread mostly through colleges. And then we realized that there was a lot of other people who were interested. And funny enough, uh, for those of us who came of age during the 1980s and 90s in the middle of the Central American Solidarity Movement, this was something that we could get a hold of. For older generations that drove in and were transported into the South through SNCC and through other efforts, it was another call to justice, one that they could travel through and move into that spoke to their way in which they behaved in, you know, within the principle of their faith, the calls in the essence of justice within the Judaic religion um, and the organizing and community building that could achieve a world in which we all could live and coexist without violence. Now, let me be real, that is not an easy calling. We know that as any other opposition to issues of justice, there are different narratives to the ways in which we act. In September of 2003, you know, Jewish Voice for Seed was, was, you know, recognized as a broad community organization uh, that moved beyond the living rooms in the Bay Area. Uh, 
and became a national organization by putting together the seeds for a strategic planning committee that will then bring us to a larger, broader uh, point of conversation. Today, we hold about 18,000 members across the country. We continue to work together for a world in which uh, we can boycott, divest, and sanction the actions of the state of Israel, not of the Jewish people. Uh, where we do so with an accountability to the Palestinians that are being displaced in their land, as we've heard from May to today, on the ongoing Nakba, uh, the usurpation of land, just like we just like it was in effect here in the United States around indigenous peoples. Uh, we have stolen land, we've displaced land for an issue for the state of Israel for the issue of power. We divest and boycott labels and companies that continue to fund the efforts of the state of Israel uh, for their own profit. Uh, for example, we divest from banks, from, you know, from organizations that, that support the prison industrial complex here and in the Middle East. Uh, we ask people to take a consideration when you're going to do your self-serve machine, try not to buy soda stream. Uh, you know, Caterpillar, who builds the, the bulldozers that help raise houses that belong for centuries to people. Um, we recent, we have a very recent victory. I want to mention it because I think it's, you know, for those, it's summer, it's hot, you're eating ice cream. So for those of you who keep up with the news, you know that Ben and Jerry's have decided that they will no longer promote or produce their products in occupied lands in Palestine. Uh, of course, the current governor of Prime Minister Bennett has said that they will sue Unilever for the right to sell ice cream and to produce ice cream. Um, um, okay, we can spend time talking about ice cream, but do you want to talk about the abuses you do against the people whose land you're stealing to produce that ice cream uh, in, in, you know, in those lands? Um, we work at the legislative level for you know, uh, bills that will not just stop the sanctioning of the BDS movement in the United States, but also that promote the well-being of families and children like HR 2590, which is currently moving its way through, con through committee in Congress. Um, we, um, we hold training, Zionism 101, wrestling with Zionism and what does it look like, particularly where we seek to live into a Jewish world that is um, different than the one that in which we're presented now. Um, what does it mean to live in this land, occupy land itself and promote the occupation of others? Um, I'm sure that Alice will speak about what does it look like when only a particular segment of the population is being vaccinated for what we know is a deadly disease. Um, apartheid did not stop when Mandela sought the freedom of South Africa. Apartheid is a systematic way in which we select a particular group of people and alienate them from their humanity. It is the purpose of Jewish for Peace that not just for racial, gender, and any other differences that we live into a world where anti-Semitism does not equal anti-Zionism, where definitions of the, um, sorry, of the stop of, you know, like our freedom to speech and to, to a freedom of speech and to speak what we believe is the right and the truth under the Judaic, you know, Judaic practices being secular or religious, um, that we have a right to do that. And that we have to right to lean into our justice principles, not just as Jews, but as Christians. And that our allies will help us achieve a time in which Palestine will be free, will be encompassing. Um, there are many other questions that I'm sure you have uh, in, the upcoming, in the upcoming minutes, but know this about us today. Jewish Voice for Peace continues to be a growing organization focused on, uh, on efforts to promote and support a, the boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, that will continue to affect the people of Palestine to seek a free, a free Palestine with the, you know, with the guidance of the people that inhabit that as well as the Jewish people living in Israel who understand that there was a time in which we all lived as one. Uh, and to do so in a way in which all of our racial, ethnic 
and other differences are honored and not used as a tools of division, just like they are in an everyday living here. For that, I ask you that you subscribe to our newsletters, that you come and participate in our webinars, that you continue to educate yourself, that you invite us to forums like this to talk about particular campaigns, that when Facebook you know, continues to shut out the voices of those who speak, um, on their behalf of the first of their humanity and of their death, that they're, you know, that you say, no, enough, listen, hear us, let others speak for themselves, because self determination is important to us and to everybody. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think there's a lot more that can be said, but for the time being, I want to make sure that. Uh, Dr. George, I have the opportunity to have her piece and we'll come back and we'll answer some questions later. John. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, we're going to hear now from Alice Rothschild, Dr. Alice Rothschild. She is um, the leader of the Jewish Voice for Peace Health Advisory Council. She's also been um, a physician, now retired, and assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard Medical School. She lectures widely and is the author of many books, including Broken Promises, Broken Dreams, Stories of Jewish and Palestinian Trauma and Resilience. She also directed the documentary film Voices Across the Divide. Uh, her website is www.alicerothschild.com. That will be in the chat section and uh, you can find that easily. Just a reminder, we will be asking for your questions after Alice gives her presentation and you can uh, ask questions and we'll uh, try to ask uh, our presenters as many of those as we can. Alice. Thank you very much. And I bring greetings from Seattle and from the lands of the Duwamish people. Uh, so I was asked to uh, give a very brief uh, personal history and then touch on some major issues now. So since there are only about a million major issues, I'm gonna do kind of a speed dating through the issues that I think we should be talking about, happy to talk about other ones. And this is just to give you a taste to stimulate conversation. So in terms of my own personal history, um, I grew up in a very traditional Zionist Jewish family in a small town, went to Hebrew school, had a bar mitzvah, went to Israel when I was 14. And so I come from that uh, tradition. Um, I'm also uh, a child of the 60s, and I got much more politically oriented in the 60s and 70s uh, and in medical school, and really uh, learned about feminism and healthcare reform and analyzing things and uh, using political principles and studying colonialism and racism and those kinds of things. And so as a Jewish person, I realized I had to struggle with the whole issue of Israel and my love, uh, uncritical love of Israel. And so in the 90s, I got involved with a group of other uh, uh, Jewish people with similar concerns. And we started examining the Israel-Palestine conflict, meeting with Palestinians, lefty Israelis, uh, lefty rabbis, a whole host of people who educated us. We started reading the new Israeli historians and gradually we uh, formed a grassroots organization. And so I've been through a number of grassroots organizations that finally uh, landed in Jewish Voice for Peace when it went uh, national. And uh, what I'm trying to do now um, on the national level is to focus on examining occupation and siege through the lens of healthcare and human rights. So that's my very quick uh, journey into this field. Um, so in terms of updates, I think I'm just going to start out uh, with a brief talk about the recent Israeli elections. And I'm going to assume that you know some basic stuff. If you don't, just ask questions and we'll fill in the details. So as you know, um, Natali Bennett, who is the head of a settler organization, won uh, the uh, you know got the uh, won the recent Israeli election. And the thing to remember about him is he is to the right of Netanyahu, and that his coalition it's a parliamentary system, so they make coalitions to have power. His coalition is extremely fragile, and the only thing that the coalition can agree on is that they want to get rid of Netanyahu, which they succeeded in doing. I think the important thing about this election is uh, looking at the Islamic party in Israel called Ra'am. So this, the third largest party in the parliament is the joint list, which is 13 Knesset members. And they are a union of four parties that represent what the Israelis call the Arab minority. I'd like to call it the Palestinian minority in Israel. And one of these four parties is the Islamic party Ra'am. And so they have three members. And so with the support of Ra'am, 
and some finagling with the other joint members about abstaining and delaying, et cetera, et cetera. Bennett won. So that's the big news on that. And the head of Ra'am is Mansour Abbas. And he was willing to sign up to a coalition of eight other parties that go across the entire political spectrum and to end Netanyahu's uh, 12 years of power. Um, from what I can tell, they also shared some religious fundamental social positions like their opposition to LGBTQ rights. So what we're seeing is after a long delitimization de 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 of the Arab voice and exclusion of Palestinians in public discourse, the Ra'am has changed the rules of the game. So the party now has won the leadership of two Knesset committees and promises of economic plans and budgets for the Palestinian community in Israel. And you know, improving infrastructure, fighting crime in Palestinian majority towns, stopping demolition of Palestinian homes, recognizing Bedouins, all sorts of things that actually would be good for Palestinian citizens. We will see if this actually happens. Um, honestly, this is likely to be a transitional government that will be replaced shortly uh, by a more right-wing administration. Now, you should also know that there was a tremendous amount of opposition within the Palestinian community in Israel, who basically said that the discrimination against Arab citizens in, uh, is, cannot be separated from the national conflict. And any solutions that ignore uh, the bigger sources of the conflict are bound to fail and may us actually be dangerous. Um, so then if we focus on the Palestinian legislative elections, just as background, Mahmoud Abbas, a different Abbas, he was elected president in 2005 for a four year term and he's still in office. And the last elections in Palestine were for the Palestinian Legislative Council, which was held in 2006. That is when Hamas won in Gaza. And then there was a brief unity government and the following year, a civil war, and then Hamas took over Gaza. So there've been various calls for elections uh, within the Palestinian uh, politic. And so in January, uh, they were promised an election. And this was indefinitely postponed in April. So the things to know about this are the Palestinian Authority and Fatah, which is the group that runs of the West Bank, is a fairly sclerotic organization. It's fairly corrupt. There's a whole patronage system. And the Palestinian Authority security works in cahoots with the Israeli security system. Basically, their job is to maintain a quiet occupation. And unfortunately, they use the exact same tactics that the um, Israeli government uses. So, uh, you know, arresting activists, tear gassing uh, demonstrators, uh, torturing prisoners, they're using the same playbook. And in exchange for this, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, receives billions of dollars from US-led, quote, donor countries and from the Palestinian taxes that are collected on its behalf by Israel. The other thing that keeps the Palestinian Authority in power is that it is a source of income for thousands and thousands of Palestinian families in the West Bank. Now, Mahmoud Abbas is very unpopular. There have been protests against him, aggressive suppression against the protests, and many feel he should have stepped down a long time ago. So the feeling is he probably uh, postponed the elections because he was afraid he would lose. But also um, the Israeli government said that the people in East Jerusalem who are Palestinian would not have the right to vote. And that was his excuse for postponing or canceling the election. And just to be clear, East Jerusalemites um, have do not have citizenship in Israel, they have residency. And so their status is um, very um, difficult for them because they're not under international law, they are occupied, but Israel doesn't recognize that. So this is all in a big mess and in a big standstill. Now, if we turn to another hot topic, uh, which uh, Elizabeth mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic, if you're really interested in the details of this, I did keep I do keep a weekly timeline of the COVID-19 pandemic in Israel-Palestine on the JVP Health uh, website. Um, but basically, to summarize it all, you know, Israel had very stringent uh, masking and social distancing at the beginning. They had a lot of trouble with the ultra-orthodox, and they under-resourced their Palestinian communities. Once they got vaccine, which they were very aggressive at getting, they had a very aggressive vaccination program only for their citizens. So currently 60% of Israeli citizens have had a, uh, at least one shot and they're now seeing the surge of Delta virus, which a uh, Delta variant, which we're also seeing here. But what their uh, program was, this is an example of what's called vaccine apartheid. 
They wanted Palestinians in the occupied territories to have the responsibilities of sovereignty, the responsibilities of providing vaccine without any of the benefits of sovereignty, having the resources and control over the system to provide it. Now in the West Bank, there were major issues at the beginning. For instance, there are probably over 100,000 uh, West Bankers that work in Israel, that work in the settlements, either legally or illegally. There are children and adults in Israeli prisons. Um, there are all sorts of folks that are in Israel that, are, uh, uh, that were not vaccinated, but you could theoretically think Israel might feel that they were at risk. There was also an incredible like 78% rise in settler attacks. Area C, which is the area of the West Bank that is controlled solely by Israel, has probably two or 300,000 Palestinians in it. They were in a no man's land about who was responsible for them. And the Israelis actually went and shut down, attacked clinics in East Jerusalem and Area C that were put up by the Palestinians. And so this was a, just a catastrophic thing. And even though the cases were 40 times higher in Israel than in the West Bank, they shut down the West Bank. Um, so this was a mess. But at first there were public health maneuvers that were very, very successful for a couple of months. And then the virus exploded in the West Bank. So now we have an overwhelmed medical uh, facilities, uh, lack of vaccine access, uh, rising Delta variant, and inadequate resources and testing. If we look at Gaza, things are like a thousand times worse. Uh, before the pandemic, Gaza was really a setup for catastrophe, an incredibly high risk population. They had maybe a hundred ventilators for 2 million people. So they were very where they couldn't cope with the pandemic. So they had very powerful public health maneuvers, um, strict quarantine, and they succeeded in stopping the entry of the vaccine into Gaza um, until August of 2020, when it exploded into the strip. Um, and then they did their total closure. And so there was a closure within a closure and people were stuck in their houses without resources, without electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there was some help from Qatar, but by March, things were really out of control. Um, one out of three tests were positive in Gaza by then. They got some vaccine began to trickle in from various sources. Um, it really kind of peaked in April. Um, and it's just been an incredibly difficult situation for Gaza. And the, there are some things that you need to think about. It had a major spike in mental health issues, um, the major spike in gender-based violence. These go together, um, increasing poverty. Um, there was a real difficulty in getting permits to leave the strip to get high level health care. Uh, so people were suffering medically. Um, and um, then on top of all of this, in May of this year, uh, there was the uh, 11 day assault. And that assault left um, over 250 people dead and almost 2000 wounded and thousands of residential and commercial units destroyed. Um, and from the vaccine point of view, vaccinations didn't come into, the, into Gaza at all during the assault. And the Israelis actually damaged the only testing site and multiple health facilities. So what's happening in Gaza now is that the people and the institutions are basically crawling out of the catastrophe of those 11 days. Um, as someone who's followed this closely and knows that people were uh, crowded together in UN schools, in their relatives' homes, you know, trying to hide from the bombing, this was a setup for massive blow up of the virus. Um, but we can't document that because there's no community testing. Because it's a very young population, they're probably not getting very sick. So we're not seeing a massive onslaught into the hospitals, but the hospitals are on life support themselves. Um, so, and it's very difficult uh, to get any medical aid into Gaza because it's so shut down. Now, so when we step back from all of this, so the big picture is uh, the issue that Israel doesn't recognize its responsibility to, uh, uh, to vaccinate uh, Palestinians occup under occupation or in their prisons or working in their uh, settlements and their construction. They see anything they give is uh, charity as opposed to obligation. And the Palestinian Authority has been forced to negotiate with a host of sources for vaccine, including COVAX, which is an international group attempting to get, to get vaccine for poor countries. There's also been a tremendous amount of vaccine washing. And the Israelis have this fantasy that they're gonna achieve herd immunity all by themselves that somehow they don't actually have contact with Palestinians who are at this point now 11% we think vaccinated. But this is a fantasy because Palestinians do come in and out of Israel. They do live in Israel. Um, and there are many more variants coming out in the West Bank and it's gonna put the Israelis at risk as well. 
So this is an example of the impact of structural racism, apartheid, cross-generational trauma. There was a real reliance on military solutions and a real disregard for the lives and health of the Palestinian people. And um, the, we also saw the rise of digital and algorithmic surveillance, which is ongoing and has crept into Israel as well. So there's some surveillance creep going on. But what this all makes very clear is that the, the health of Palestinians is intrinsically related to their liberation and to the end of the siege. And also that not only does Israel have a moral and by international law legal responsibility to vaccinate Palestinians, but it's also in their self-interest and they're so blind they can't see that. So I wanna now focus on the May assault in this speed date. Um, so the thing to remember is that there were multiple provocations by Israel in East Jerusalem at Al-Aqsa Mosque. You know, over 300 people were uh, injured. Um, so Israel poked and poked and poked and poked until Hamas finally felt that they needed to launch rockets. So what was different about this attack than all the other attacks? I won't go into the horrendous uh, details. Um, but the things that were different this time is that first of all, Palestinians in Israel, in Acre, in Haifa, in Jaffa, in Lod, in Nazareth, in Ramla, rose up in protest. So for the first time we had Palestinians protesting on behalf of their brothers and sisters in Gaza. The, and so that implies that Palestinian citizens of Israel have actually reached some kind of breaking point after 72 years of racist and exclusionary policies by the Israeli government. Um, and by the Israeli attacks in East Jerusalem and the ever increasing rightward tending towards fascistic political parties in Israel. The other thing that happened, which was very, very different is that there were protests all over the West Bank. So you see sort of a unity amongst all the Palestinians and all the places that they were located calling out this assault. So this is what's really different. So we're seeing attitudinal changes both in the region, but also in the world. Um, you know, there's more unity in the Palestinian community locally and nationally. Uh, people are organizing outside their usual political boxes. The BDS movement and the condemnation of Israeli uh, governmental behavior is much more international. And in the United States, there has been a dramatic change in opinion uh, that's generational. So older folks like me uh, tend to stand with Israel right or wrong and see every criticism of Israel as a type of anti-Semitism, but their children, their grandchildren are all in a different camp and are recognizing uh, the narrative of Palestinian history and the rights of Palestinians to have um, equal rights to Israeli Jews. Um, we also are beginning to see some cracks in the mainstream media. I would call attention to uh, a new uh, bureau chief in uh, Jerusalem, Patrick Kingsley at the New York Times. He and his cohort have written some really amazing pieces that you know five years ago would never, never have happened in the New York Times. So there are some cracks there. Um, I wanna focus a little bit on the academy because that's something I'm very interested in. Uh, because in uh, the academy, in medical journals, in scientific journals, in social science journals, uh, there's a long and painful history of suppression of information and opinion on healthcare and health status in the occupied territories. And there was just a, a recent amazing blow up that I'm going to explain to you um, regarding the Scientific American and the British Medical Journal. So we know that academic journals and research in medical fields, social, political sciences, now have some kind of understanding about structural racism, implicit bias, and the personal and public health costs of bigotry, chronic stress, what I call the diseases of oppression. But there's one area of scholarship where these rules don't apply, and big surprise, that's Palestine. So there was in, uh, on June 2nd, an article published in the Scientific American called As Healthcare Workers We Stand in Support of Palestine. It was a brilliant article documented uh, what was going on in uh, Gaza and about the impact of uh, micro and macro aggressions within the United States. And it really outlined the human and medical consequences of what's happening in Gaza. And um, this piece lasted nine days before it was retracted. And we see this over and over and over again, the very esteemed journals put out something that's actual factual material, vetted, fact-checked, et cetera, et cetera. And then they get viciously attacked by Hasbara organizations. And then they retract 
articles that are accurate, or they get very apologetic and start doing apologies, or um, they publish, you know, a whole journal on how wonderful healthcare is in Israel. So this kind of suppression is ongoing, and um, there's been a lot of talk about this and a lot of concern that this is how the um, academic community is functioning. So I was absolutely thrilled to see uh, July 9th in the British Medical Journal, some, a piece called A Call on Academics and Humanitarian Workers to Speak Up for a Palestinian Right to Health and an End to the Mis Israeli Military Occupation. So they named what was going on. They put it in a bigger international context of attacks in Myanmar and Tigray and Syria and Afghanistan and folks, places like that on healthcare systems, on institutions, and said that medical people and human rights people and academics have uh, responsibility to speak out against this. And so this is a, a big deal. Um, and there's actually a group called the Global Alliance on War, Conflict and Health that is pursuing uh, this movement. So this made me feel, um, feel with happiness, basically, that now it's being said, research has have a responsibility to amplify the voices of those experiencing, you know, the lived burdens of war, occupation, armed conflict, etc., and that that must include Palestine. So what I'm gonna conclude now is that when we look at the whole picture, we see basically a continued ongoing Nakba of Palestine. We see an ongoing colonization project with Israeli settlements and Israeli control. And what we have to remember is that the status quo can only continue if we as human beings see Jews as more human, more deserving, more innocent, more honorable than Palestinian Arabs. And tragically, that attitude is the core of Zionism. So we as a community, if we stay blind to Arab suffering, this suffering will continue. So the fundamental issue of this conflict is one of racism and very violent settler colonialism. And as we can see, it can potentially lead to ethnic cleansing and genocide. And that is something that we must work to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. I'm going to follow up briefly just with a question to you and um, should be fairly simple, but if we talk about liberal Zionists, uh, both Jewish and uh, Christian liberal Zionists, what does that mean and how are they different from somebody like you? So uh, my understanding of liberal Zionists are the following. Um, Jewish people in general for years have been uh, a progressive subgroup of society. Uh, we support civil rights and human rights and labor unions and all sorts of things that are called progressive. And so, um, and we pride ourselves in our progressiveness. So liberal Zionists embrace those kinds of things. And they also embrace a fantasy of Israel that Israel somehow can be a democratic just society while it's privileging Jews over non-Jewish people. And that somehow Israel can get away with what was an ethnic cleansing at its origins, like the United States, like Australia, like New Zealand, like many, many countries. But somehow Jews had a right to do that because of the trauma of the Holocaust. So for me, liberal Zionists are very decent, good people who have this sense that Israel is the exception. And they are unwilling to confront the consequences of Zionism, which is a political movement that privileges Jews over everyone else. And I would argue that as long as you embrace a movement that privileges one group over another, that you can't live in a just society, that you can't have a true democracy, that you can't treat everyone equally if some people, people are more equal than others. And so that's the dilemma for liberal Zionists. All right, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth and then Alice, I, I wonder about the, um, you, you both alluded to uh, increasing awareness, um, activity, advocacy among, uh, in the Jewish community. What is the, um, the extent of the outreach of Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, Elizabeth? And uh, I sense it goes beyond the 18,000 you mentioned. And then do you see this uh, growing? Um, you see this growing uh, uh, exponentially, or is this a, a kind of flash in the pan? So let me, uh, from the Jewish Voice for Peace perspective, from David Peace perspective, we have uh, the, mention, the, the number that I mentioned earlier, 18,000, is our Jews paying members. 
but our reach is over 200,000. When you really take a look at our social media, our, um, you know, our engagements, the people who show up to our actions, the people who receive our newsletters, uh, we know that this is a growing movement. Alice uh, very clearly spoke to uh, the place where naturally in the, in the, in the ways in which movements move and wave in and out, youth has always been that force that crosses that way to grow. Uh, it is no different today than it has been in the past. We find our numbers growing exponentially and people under the age of 35, millennials, uh, you know, seers and, and the like, uh, while remaining steady in our numbers for Gen Xers and baby boomers, who again came up through a justice lens in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, we've seen what medical apartheid looked like around HIV AIDS. We have seen, um, you know, what does it look like for people in Central America not to do. We've seen what our work was able to accomplish in the South. And so our children continue to engage in questioning uh, the authority, questioning the narrative of as Alice again refers to one group of people being better than the other. And this is something that we don't just see in Judaism, we see this across the board. But as it refers to Jewish Voices for Peace and the work that we do, it is amazing to all of us that, that the core of the people on the streets, vocal and making sure that these issues are heard are people under the age of 35. And we, we have people in, in high schools and middle schools in Hebrew school and Jewish in synagogues and in others saying to their parents, I doubt your narrative. That is an opening that we must not waste. And so we engage in education, we continue to grow. It is a garden that we continue to water and to, you know, because the flowers that will be born out of that will be what will eventually make sure that this oppression, as we know it, particularly as the, as the first the genocide of the Palestinian people, will stop in Palestine and will be free. And the thing I would like to add is that um, everybody has their tipping point where their blindness can't continue to exist. And what I've seen is after each uh, massive assault on Gaza, some collection of people, Jewish, non-Jewish, Christian, whatever, reach a point where they can't not see this anymore. And the problem is that once you see it, then you can't unsee it. The other uh, tipping point thing that happened in this movement uh, was that Black Lives Matter folks in their position paper a couple of years ago stood in solidarity with Palestine. And to uh, the, the African-American community has had a lot of difficulty uh, addressing the whole Zionism question, um, partly because uh, Jews have been very supportive uh, to African-Americans in the civil rights movement and marched with African-Americans, we still do. Um, and uh, African-Americans did not want to offend their Jewish sisters and brothers. And so they stood with Israel and you know they saw Israel as sort of a redemptive kind of place and, kind, and ignored uh, the, the apparent Islamophobia, racism, et cetera. And with Black Lives Matter taking this position it created a space for African Americans to march, for us to march with African Americans and for African Americans to march with us um, and to, uh, to work harder on the accusation that this is anti Semitic when you have Jews and, and Blacks working together. Um, the other thing is that the Palestinian community has, um, particularly uh, the earlier generations, were pretty fearful in the United States to speak out. There's so much anti-Arab racism after 9-11. Uh, Palestinians just didn't want to raise their heads because they would get chopped off. But their children and their grandchildren are now loud and vocal and organized. So we have a much uh, more dynamic and loud uh, Palestinian uh, voice, Palestinian organizations that we all can work together. And so that also has raised the profile. So Jewish Voice for Peace is very, very um, proactive about intersectionality, about finding who our allies are and marching all together and learning and, and understanding that Jews don't have to take the leadership in this all the time, uh, that there are people, for instance, Palestinian leadership that we should be listening to. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> um, thank you. I, um, 
there's been some prominent uh, Jews. It was mentioned earlier about Ben and Jerry's uh, deciding not to sell in the West Bank. Uh, Peter Beinart, who I think had been uh, listed as among the liberal Zionists recently uh, declared his support for a one state solution. Um, is this uh, movement growing among uh, prominent, well, how are, how are Jews reacting to these um, kind of announcements, do you think? Or how are your supporters reacting to these kinds of announcements? Um, I, I will tell you that I take the Ben and Jerry's victory very personal uh, because when Ben and Jerry's went silent, uh, a few months ago after making some statements in their website. Uh, it was uh, one of our staffers and they're in, you know, from, and, you know, in conjunction with allies within the Black Lives Matter who called Ben and Jerry's to the carpet. Said, when are you gonna speak about this? Are you gonna stop doing this? Uh, and the conversations around what does it look like to not just sell your product, which but to produce your product there. That you were occupying and taking land that was bought by settlers to produce something to your benefit. Um, and for Ben & Jerry's to, even though as part of a larger organization that we know is in Unilever is an important money. I mean, you know, think about this. Ben is not calling Ben & Jerry's. Ben is going to Unilever who owns Ben & Jerry's and saying, you need to bring your people in line. And Ben & Jerry's is like, we are, you know, we're speaking from the Ben & Jerry's company and we're, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to move forward. Um, I think, you know, to Alice's point, cognitive, cognitive dissonance at one point stops you from functioning. And when you, when you can no longer reconcile what you are, um, what you're witnessing, in a, in a world with global communications and global witnessing, this is no more her say. This is not the paper saying something. People have used social medias in ways in which are effective and eye widening. We see people finally saying, this is not just hearsay. I am witnessing this violence. I am witnesses this apartheid. I am witnessing this genocide. And how does that then fit with this belief I've had until this moment. And it is in that moment of awakening that people are able to then engage in productive conversations uh, that will help them move in a direction of justice and not simply existence. Okay. Um, I think right, that so within- Before you start, uh, Alice, uh, just please do put your questions in the chat. We're not getting a whole lot. And they, I think sometimes we assume that you well, remember that if you have a question for Alice or Elizabeth, please put it in the chat. Sorry, Alice, go ahead. So I think, you know, within the sort of progressive anti-Zionist, questioning Zionism, whatever you want to call it, community, people are like cheering. Um, the thing I find really interesting is the response of the mainstream community and the Israeli government. Um, they are bordering on hysterical. And it's so, you know, you feel like this is an ice cream factory, you know, but I think the important the, th the reason why there's so much hysteria in the mainstream and in the Israeli government, you know, calling this, you know, anti-Semitic ice cream, and you know, it's really stunning when you look at it, is what it uh, symbolizes. It symbolizes that people can create a, a boycott movement that challenges the siege and occupation and the treatment of Palestinians in Israel, and they can succeed at something. And it, it really brings it home that companies are going to pay attention to this. And when you know capitalism starts paying attention, there's going to be some political movement. So you know many other companies have pulled out of the West Bank, and there's been a lot of other stuff. But this is somehow very personal. So I think that people are excited, and the people who don't like this excitement are really, really uh, freaked out. Um, the other thing is in terms of having your eyes open, as Elizabeth was talking about. I think with um, the uh, the violence, the police violence that we've seen in our cities and at home, this has really brought home um, what this violent, what this kind of violence means, what it means to be tear gas, what it means to be uh, killing black people. You know, this is like in our faces. And one of the big successes of the movement 
is to draw the lines between what's happening here and what's happening in Israel and Palestine. So, you know, the fact that a lot of police have been trained in Israel, they're using the techniques of an occupying force to come home and occupy our cities. They're using the same weaponry, the same tear gas, the same whatever horrific things they're bopping people on the heads with. It's the same stuff. So you can't, you know, close your eyes when, you know, your cousin just got tear gas downtown. So I think there's a lot of uh, power in the, the experience here that, and people are making the links which between racism, between the killing of black people, between police brutality. And that's really important because it is all the same. And, and, and I wanna to add to Alice's point here that we do have, we do hold a campaign called the Deadly Exchange, which seeks to pass resolutions in, you know, uh, you know, from the local level to the federal level around the divestment of monies uh, to Israel through the exchange of weapons and knowledge that are then used in the United States um, to suppress, oppress and kill our people. Um, and it is something that people do not speak about. Um, mm -hmm. But when you purchase this knowledge, you contribute to a three trillion at, you know, dollar annual investment in an ally that then sells us the ways in which we suppress uh, the freedoms that uh, many people have so hard sacrificed for in this country, even if we have such a long way to go for justice in this country itself. And there was this Israeli uh, security company, I can't remember the name of it, just revealed that their NSO, NSO, NSO security. has been yeah, using to spy on journalists and activists. You know, we're not safe um, as long as it, this and, kind and of- And government people. officials, they just found in their records that mm -hmm. they've spied on Macron, they've spied on the prime minister of Germany, they, anybody who they perceive to be an enemy of their, of their goals, they have spied on. Um, this is not, something that does okay. not affect your every day. Right. I'd, I'd like to turn just for a bit to the, uh, the fact that we have a largely Christian audience or church-based audience. Um, churches, denominations have uh, been active and as best they can in opposing uh, human rights violations. Just this past week, the United Church of Christ uh, passed a, a very strong resolution mentioning or talking about Israel as an apartheid state um, but how do, what would you advise to Christians who are um, frightened of speaking out in this way, uh, fearful of being called anti-Semitic, uh, fearful of being, of somehow dishonoring the memory of the Holocaust, and particularly in light of the fact that so many states are uh, passing resolutions making BDS a, a crime, uh, that they're not able to, um, that's just a, something I think a lot of us in the church world are worried about. We want to be able to do that. We, we're told that students in universities are being discriminated against Jewish students now. You know, it's a, that's part of the dilemma for us Christians. Um, how about uh, either of you just take a brief uh, shot at that? Sure. So, so I, go ahead, Alice. Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> So um, first of all, I, I think we need to acknowledge this is a really hard place. And one of the things that is important is to listen to people and their trauma and their concerns, but then to start dissecting what they're talking about. So anti-Semitism is hatred of a people, um, you know, characterizing, you know, caricatures and all that kind of stuff. That is very different from hating a country, which is Israel. And I think one of the things that we need to sort out or tease out is the difference between, you know, Judaism, which is a religion, Zionism is a political movement, Israel is a country. You can talk about all of them separately and that all Jews are not Zionists, all Jews are not Israeli, all Israelis are not Jews. I mean, you know, you got to make the, the language really, really clear. And there will be people in the Jewish community who will be heartbroken, who will accuse you of being a traitor, who will, God knows what they will call you. But I think you need to find your Jewish allies and work with the protection of a Jewish ally to, to tease through what the, what the language is and to help people to be braver about speaking out. And you know what I will often say to people is, is this good for the Jews? I mean, if all you're concerned about is the Jewish people, is what Israel doing really good for the Jews? Did we really struggle to create this particular society? Do you support uh, ethnic cleansing? Do you support 
you know, women delivering at checkpoints and children being bombed, you know, is this really what you mean, you know? Um, and I think it's important to educate people about the number of Jews who do not support Israel, who are not Zionists, who are questioning Zionism, and it, it gives some breathing space to have this conversation. But there is no doubt in my mind that this is very hard. And having the State Department with its ridiculous, dis, you know, description of what anti-Semitism is, and one of them is criticizing the State of Israel, it makes it really hard. And it is a dangerous time. And so we need to be doing political organizing around on the state level, on the federal level, about all these, you know, definitions of BDS as a crime. I mean, BDS is a political movement, nonviolent political movement, and it is um, the power of our voices that is going to change the political climate and make it, uh, you know, make it better. Can I for a second address the denominational question, John, you posed around not just, so I, I want to be clear that what I'm about to say predates my employment at JVP, uh, <laughs> just for the sole reason that I don't want people to think that, you know, I did this because I work here now. Um, I happen to be a board member of several iterations of, of boards and so on within some of the seven, you know, seven large denominations, including the UCC. And as part of both the, Lat the Latinx and the LGBTQ programs, we work together with others to put, to put that resolution that just passed uh, at the UCC. And the amount of education, of materials, of conversations, of heart to hearts that we had to have with one another around the points that Alice brings, the differentiation in language, the misunderstanding of what each of those things means. Uh, taught me that the number one place for us to look for allies and to have the conversations with churches, congregations, and, and you know, in, in the denominations at large is to begin defining what that means. What does it, what does the religion means versus the state means? Because Israel has been so successful as equating the state of Israel with the religion of Judaism, people feel entitled to call you anti-Semitic for the simple reason of the same way in which they call you anti-American because you questions the action of your government against its own people. It is the same thing. The state of Israel is very different than the religion at large. We know that large mem a large portion of the, uh, the Jewish population across the world uh, does not agree with the actions of the state of Israel, in, even within the borders of Israel. These are voices that are silenced. And I'll tell you that from personal experience where my spouse happened to have gone to Israel. She, she is the child of a, you know, an, uh, a Muslim Arab and in an, um, an Ashkenazi Jew. And she was stopped at the, she was stopped at, you know, at the airport for seven hours and was questioned for seven hours on her right to visit her land. What are you doing here? Like, what do you bring? Like, are you trying to destroy us? Um, and her answer being, no, I'm here to see both my people because both my people originate here. They, they, they coexist here. Um, and to have to witness what her family had gone through um, and bring that, that information back home to the work that we were doing and the policy, it's, you know, I don't recommend you go to the Middle East at the moment, but when you do, make sure, when and if you do, make sure you don't stay isolated by the washing away of the injustice against the Palestinian people. Uh, make sure that you see the, the cattle-like conditions by which Palestinians have to go through in order to move from one side of the, of the country to the other, from one side of Jerusalem to the other. Um, you know, the lack of water, the separation, the, 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 the withdrawal of the right to home and land. Um, but because when you see that, you understand what it is that we're talking about. And if you cannot go and you need to see that, there are plenty of examples of how we've perfected that system called reservations in this country. Okay. Friends, we're at, we're at the hour. Uh, we did have a request from someone who uh, I was told can't type a question. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to make the decision to let that person speak. Her name is Lynn Siegel. Um, Lynn, uh, wherever you are and whatever your question is, it's got to be a good question and, and follow our rules. Um, no you're on, okay? <laughs> no, whatsoever. Why were there Palestinian Israelis in the first place? Why were there Palestinian Israelis in the first place? Thank so, you. 
So the question is, why are there Israelis who are Palestinian in the first place? So um, if you look at the history, um, before um, 1900, there were uh, people living in what is called historic Palestine. Most of them were Muslim, some of them were Christian, and a small number were Jewish. And they were living together in the Ottoman Empire, um, basically fairly harmoniously. Um, and then they were colonized by the British. And then uh, that, you know, all the things that happened in the 20th century uh, led to the founding of the State of Israel. So the Palestinians that were living in historic Palestine were there. And then uh, there was Jewish immigration starting in the late 1800s, early 1900s in response to the anti-Semitism in uh, the e Eastern Europe and in Russia. And so the Ashkenazi, the European Jews that came, uh, came in response to anti-Semitism from Europe and then came to historic Palestine. And basically the big problem is that as the Zionist movement grew, uh, they didn't come to share the land with whoever was living there. They came to claim the land. And, and that is really sort of, the original crisis and the ideology of everything that came from there. And um, the uh, Jews from Arab countries and from North Africa um, came in various waves um, and that's a whole nother history. Uh, but what happened was that there was a flourishing Jewish community in the Arab world. They considered themselves Arabs, they spoke Arabic, um, but the countries that they lived in uh, were really uh, unhappy with the way Israel treated the Palestinians and there was a whole um, stirring up of protests, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a whole messy history and they were brought to Israel. So then there was the importation of Jews from Arab countries in North Africa. And interestingly, because Ashkenazis brought the European racism with them, uh, Jews of color in Israel are in the lower socioeconomics, don't tend to have positions of power, are, are like African-Americans here um, in some ways. All right. I'm going to, uh, here's what I'd like to do to wrap up. We have two more questions that people have been waiting to ask and I'm just now seeing them. So I'm gonna ask you, Alice, one question and you, Elizabeth, the other question. And then, um, uh, and then we'll close. And just, if you can try to limit it to about a minute and a half. I know that might be tough. Uh, here's a question uh, for, um, you, uh, Elizabeth, I'm gonna ask this, a huge obstacle toward Palestinian support has been statements by various organizations who advocate the destruction of Israel. Are those organizations still advocating such extreme actions? Can you give us a brief answer there? There's always going to be organizations that go to the extreme. Um, it doesn't matter what the movement is. That is um, radical movements thrive on creating discord because they understand that that is what brings attention and they then co-opt the dialogue uh, and other issues. So would they stop existing? No, it is our job to continue to inoculate people against that type of extremism, court, you know, regardless of what the issue of justice is um, and to call people to justice to call people to fairness and to call states across the country, in particular the state of Israel, to do right by its own people and to understand its own history and not to be imitators and repeaters of that that they so suffered. Uh, to inoculate their own people from that that they brought into the, brought with themselves, as Alice says, uh, and that has then resulted in so many of the current situations. Excellent. So will they stop, stop existing? No, it's our job to to silence them in ways in which they're no longer effective. Okay, and um, thank you. Thank you, Liz. But then Alice, uh, we have a question about one state and two states. How can it remain? How can Israel remain a, a Jewish state if there's just one state? And could you address that briefly? Um, sure. So. The, the question of one state, two state, federation, et cetera, et cetera, is hotly debated. I think the first thing we need to understand is that as long as there is a Jewish state, 
it cannot be a democracy of all of its citizens. And as long as there are people living under a brutal occupation, there cannot be a just and uh, really vigorous uh, resolution of these issues. So it's becoming increasingly clear that there has to be some uh, bigger uh, thinking out of the box beyond a two state solution, whether that's one state federation, et cetera, et cetera, is for people in the region and their supporters to figure out. Clearly, I think the um, Jewish character of Israel is well established. Hebrew is spoken throughout the country. There's a tremendous amount of Jewish history. There will always be Jewish character to the country, but it will not be a Jewish state in the future if we move to a more just and democratic solution. And that's a real stumbling block for a lot of people. Great, thank you both. Um, we've come to the close here. What we've been doing is uh, allowing people to uh, speak amongst themselves and have a little chat time afterward, which is kind of fun. Uh, but we will excuse our presenters on behalf of all of us. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us today and, um, and imparting this wisdom. Uh, we truly appreciate it. I believe um, uh, uh, Bridget wants to say something now. Hi everyone, uh, just a really quick announcement. Um, we will be alternating our webinars with UMKR. So I believe John, you correct me, um, the next UMKR webinar is gonna be in September, is that right? Correct. Fantastic. And next month in August, we will be introducing a new webinar series that's gonna be co-sponsored by MFSA, UMKR, and the National Association of Internet, the Native American International Caucus. We're co-sponsoring a webinar on the doctrine of discovery. It'll be a webinar series um, that will be an introduction to um, colonialism in a larger series. So you'll hear some more information about that. And I hope that you all will join us on those calls. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all.